So I've seen some of you, I've given a version of this talk before, um, and I, I, I've kind of updated it because even though I've called it detective stories, we don't get to that part until a little bit later, but um, I'm a geologist by training. I have a bachelor's of arts in physics um, before I started my geo geological training. And, and astronomy was truly the gateway for me. It was kind of my gateway drug into sort of our physics department, small liberal arts colleges, you know, physics and astronomy are usually really heavily fused together. And um, I did a bunch of internships in astronomy, actually at Green Bank. We were just talking about Green Bank. I did back when everybody still lived essentially on campus. Um, and so I did, a, I did an internship there, which was my second internship in astronomy. And I was like, this stuff is so cool and I really don't wanna do it. And I got back to, I got back for my senior year and I had a, I had a physics professor who had a project in planetary geology and it really did the trick for me, which was really wanting to immerse myself in looking at the surfaces of these planets in visible light and getting to see all of the really weird terrains and formations that you get an opportunity to see. And that was really the kind of perfect fusion for me of something really tangible, um, but space related. And so I really zeroed in on the outer solar system very, very quickly in my career. And I kind of want to fuse all of the reasons why everybody else should be really excited about uh, the outer solar system, even if you don't care about the geology part of things. Um, so I'm going to try and put all these things together. Um, so really, this is kind of my favorite things talk. Great. So I want to talk about our outer solar, our solar system as a series of systems, right? Um, each one of the large planets, including Pluto, in the outer solar system all are their own individual systems. And I think this is a really cool way of thinking about our solar system rather than just a bunch of planets going around the sun. Because when you start thinking about extrasolar planets, those are planets going around another star, but what if those planets also had moons? And it starts igniting this idea that it's not just planets and extrasolar planets that we should be caring about when we start exploring or continue exploring our universe and our sort of place in space. But if you start breaking down all those planets into their own planetary systems, you start to really think about the diversity of objects that are actually out there and all of the places you might be able to inhabit with other kinds of life, not, not necessarily intelligent life, but life in general. So if you're an astrobiologist or a geologist or an astronomer or planetary astronomer or planetary scientist, there's so much here. And of course, it's gonna be a while before we get the kind of data we have for our solar system about other solar systems and other planetary systems. And so I love this particular infographic because it really breaks everything down into kind of their own system um, and gives, this different perspective, this different way of thinking about things. So I already kind of introed myself a little bit. Um, but what I care about the most about these systems are all the things that turn out to not be planets, which is kind of ironic since I'm a planetary geologist um, and I don't actually study any planets. Um, I study all the moons of those planets. Um, so I tend to call these things planets, even though they're not. Um, but this is a my favorite infographic that was made by Emily Loftwalla when she was still at the Planetary Society. And they're all to scale, but it shows you kind of this wealth, this diversity of different places that we have just in our own solar system. And I alluded to this already in that I don't think anybody thinks our solar system is weird because this is our place, right? This is our solar system. This is the normal place. But the deeper you look into it, and we're gonna get into a lot of pictures of weird places in the solar system. Our solar system is, is weird. I'm just gonna put that out there as, I believe our solar system is weird. Um, but what I love about how weird our solar system is, is other solar systems get weirder too, right? Because how many terrestrial planets do we have, right? And then you get the TRAPPIST-1 system, they beat us, right? They got even more. So how many more moons might be in that system? Um, I don't think there's kind of this normal when it comes to solar systems. Um, and I think ours has a wealth of information to kind of show us how weird ours is, um, which I think is really exciting when you think about what these other solar systems might be like. Oh, I'm, it's, it's directional. No, it's fine. <laughs> so um, I love thinking about this. And it was actually the last time I gave a talk at Observe the Moon Night in 2019-ish. Uh, there was a talk um, 
from a scientist at Goddard who was working on the test mission. And that was the first time I kind of started to realize how many more exoplanets there still are to discover. So the Kepler mission, which is this first spacecraft on the upper right, now has officially discovered a, almost 5,500 exoplanets, right? And why that's kind of exceptional is that it was just looking at this teeny little tiny part of the sky. And nobody think there, thought there was going to be that many, but it was just this teeny tiny part of the sky, and it found 5,500 exoplanets. And now you have Tess, who's working really hard to essentially map the sky. Right. And it's just like racking up all of these additional exoplanets. Now, this is where I'm not 100 percent sure. I think Kepler looks deeper. Tess is looking a little closer. Can anybody? Yes. I saw one nod. Right. So if you imagine doing Kepler depth with Tess coverage, this number, this 5500 is just going to explode. There's just so many more planets out there than I think Frank Drink ever dreamed. Um, I already said this, but this was just a shameless plug for JWST's amazing planetary science capabilities. I'm just going to skip right past the that because I show some more of these later. Um, but I think JWST's team has done a really amazing job of proving to the planetary scientists why we should care about their telescope because of the amount of planetary science that they can do, not just astronomy. And I think as they keep releasing these images, um, and I didn't put in the new Enceladus image, but has anybody seen the new Enceladus image? The plume is like 150 times bigger than they thought or something wild like that. Um, not in terms of mass flux, but the plume itself just is just spray painting everything, um, which is really cool. So I want to talk about these systems, characterize these systems just a little bit before we get into kind of a slideshow-ish of um, some of my favorite places in our solar system um, because they look so wild. The Jupiter system is typically characterized by these four large Galilean satellites. What is it, like 400 years ago? We've known about these things for a really long time. We haven't known that they're as cool as they are for 400 years, but we've known they've been around. Um, since Galileo, there's 80, 95 moons. I put question marks because let's be honest, in like another couple of years, those numbers are going to be wrong because people are just going to keep finding new things. And the thing that I didn't illustrate here is that you also have the Trojans of Jupiter, right? You have all of these asteroid type things orbiting in the same path as Jupiter around the sun. So in addition to the things going around Jupiter, there's a bunch of stuff kind of hanging on to Jupiter as it goes around the sun. There's all kinds of things in this system alone. Oh, and rings. Jupiter has rings. They all have rings. Because of course, Saturn gets all the attention for the rings. But Saturn has recently 145. I don't know who discovered all of the new moons, but here there's like another 26 moons. Um, and then did I get it? I don't know. You'll have to look. Um, so Saturn has the main rings that you, you think of, right? All these really beautiful kind of really narrow rings. But of course we have this big, thick, diff thick and diffuse, that's not right. This big wide ring um, that's very diffuse that's made out of, made by Enceladus essentially. If you don't know, Enceladus has a huge plume of water shooting out of its south pole. Enceladus is about the size of Washington state. So she's tiny and she's active and she's making this ring that, um, is really big and is just kind of like spewing water ice on top of everything. But in addition to places like Enceladus, um, Saturn has places like Titan, which has a huge thick atmosphere. It has liquid methane ethane lakes on the surface. It has dunes as big as the Namib dunes. It, it's, it's a wild system. When you break down each one of these individual moons, they're truly their um, individual kind of planets, in my, in my opinion. Don't tell the IAU. I know that's not the real definition of a planet. Then we get into the Uranian system. Um, you start talking about the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, and they're really exciting, but they're only exciting if you paid attention to Voyager. And if you've forgotten about Voyager, I encourage you to go back and look at the data that came back from that spacecraft because nothing compares to these images because we have nothing like them. But if you're a really Mars rover nerd, you're not impressed by the resolution of these images. But when you think about the fact that we only have eight pictures of these wild places, this is really, these places are really, really exciting, but they're often forgotten. So the Uranian system, of course, it has um, rings. These are, these are Voyager rings, 
So these are kind of more the discovery. These aren't the discovery images, but um, these are the uh, earlier pictures of the rings and that's a JWST image up at the top there. And if you haven't been part of the planetary news cycle, uh, the decadal planetary science decadal yeah. survey was released last year and the Uranus orbiter and probe was identified as the top priority flagship. And one of the reasons I think, there's a lot of reasons why this mission came up, bubbled up to the top. One reason is that it was identified as high pri priority last decade. It wasn't the first priority, but it was a high priority. Congress loves to see consistency in our community in terms of pulling up which mission they're gonna spend billions of dollars on. But the other reason um, is that Flagship missions really, really do well when they can deliver community level science. So we're talking about ice giant people, we're talking about gas giant people, we're talking about atmospheres people, magnetosphere people, particles people, rings people, moons people. It really gives data that can feed the entire planetary science community and impart the planetary, the, um, planetary astronomy community in a way that some of the other flagships didn't check those boxes, right? And so these kinds of missions, when you're spending billions of dollars, can feed data to the entire community is an incredibly valuable aspect of a flagship mission. Um, this is just the cover page and sort of the executive summary of what the Uranus orbiter and probe is gonna do. And it's this little thing, if you've seen the Huygens probe on the side of Cassini, they look pretty similar in this, in this schematic. These are really rough plans when you do these mission concept studies you're not working with a lot of information because NASA hasn't given you a budget and you don't know what is gonna, like who's gonna build the next instrument that you're gonna strap onto one of these things. So um, you have a lot of free parameters. And so these studies really try and get a perspective of what, um, what the feasibility is like. Um, and so while the science is pretty much gonna be about the same, uh, the capability of these spacecraft is gonna obviously change with technology. So we hope this happens in this decade. Um, it was announced as the top priority flagship last year when they um, released the results of the decadal survey. Currently, there is no line item in NASA's budget for a new, a new start is what they call it. Um, how you get a new start is a great question. We can talk more about that. Uh, but the short version is every flagship new start has a different way in which it becomes a line item in the budget. So being that the budget fluctuates, being that flagships are expensive and you need somebody to kind of shepherd it through the process of approval, hopefully soon. But so far this is considered a top priority, but it has not been considered a new start. So there's currently no money going towards it. Funding is complicated, you all know. It doesn't matter that it's just NASA, it's everywhere. So then we have the Neptune system. Um, Neptune's interesting in that you expect it to be like the Uranian system in that you expect it to have a huge family of regular moons, right? Round, weird moons. Um, but it only has the one big one, Triton. And Triton's weird because Triton didn't form around Neptune. It was captured. It's in a retrograde orbit, so it goes the wrong way around. Um, the orbit's kind of tilted. And uh, then Neptune just has all these kind of weird wobbly potatoes that goes around it. Um, and Triton's really wild. I have more pictures of Triton that I will show you, but it's got a tenuous atmosphere. It was um, Voyager saw active plumes on the surface, which doesn't make any sense. It's cold and weird out there. Um, so Neptune's system is weird because it doesn't have the like seven big moons that it, you have at Uranus or you know the other large regular moons that you have at the other gas giants. Um, so that makes Neptune system a lot different. Um, but Triton is a place that is so exciting to the planetary science community that for the medium-sized missions that NASA does called New Frontiers, Triton will be added to the list of possible missions in, that's a complicated story, but in years, Triton will be on the list of missions that people can propose to go, um, which is, We'll talk more, I promise. Just trying to give you a system overview. I have so many things I wanna say. The Pluto system is one of my favorite because I remember going to a workshop prior to the arrival of New Horizons at the Pluto system. 
Um, and keep in mind, this is a weird picture of the Pluto system because it's actually tilted. It's tilted on the side. It's like a bullseye. If you were standing on the sun, don't do that. But if you were standing on the sun and looking at Pluto, you would see it as a bullseye rather than a dinner plate kind of edge on. So the whole system's tilted up. And I went to this workshop and everybody's like, we don't know what's going to be there, but it's probably not going to be that cool. <laughs> and I realized I wasn't part of that mission, but you know, ha. That's all you can say about it, right? But Pluto's its own system, and it's weird because it's got this, it's this binary sort of planet system, but then it's got all these really weird, cool extra moons, or moonlets, depending on how you like to say that. Um, so the Pluto system was like nothing anybody ever expected, um, and I think that's, that's the perfect sort of end point, right? I mean, if, for scientists of my generation, this was kind of our last opportunity to see something for the first time. And by see something, I mean like geologically see something for the first time. We've sort of seen a lot of other things. So until we continue going, until we start going to more small bodies, asteroids, those kinds of things, this was kind of like my last, the last shot, right? It's kind of the last frontier of places we hadn't seen yet. Um, and the thing that sort of ties all these systems together is water. If you're an astrobiology nerd, you know water is one of the like main things you need, right? And not just water, but liquid water. So my argument here is that it's not just about these systems being wild and wacky. It's that all of these systems are dominated by moons and moonlets that probably have liquid water or had liquid water in their subsurfaces. Because most of these moons are not made out of rock. Most of these moons are made out of water ice. So it's usually water, ice shell, liquid ocean, rocky core. And so when we talk about places like the Earth, this is the Earth to scale with respect to Saturn's moon, Titan, Jupiter's moon, Europa. That's Pluto. That's Ganymede, Jupiter's moon, Ganymede. Look how much water there is on Earth with respect to how much water you have on these other moons. Right? There's significantly less water on Earth than any one of those individual moons. But we think like Earth is the cool place to look for life. And so I'm going to argue that all of these places are thought to have liquid water oceans in their subsurface. This is just four of the moons of the four systems that I've just talked about, five systems I've just talked about. There's an enormous amount of water in the outer solar system, and a lot of it's liquid. And that's a really exciting thing if you're an astrobiologist. As a geologist, I want to help the astrobiologists figure out which one of these places we should go to next. Is that just rainwater, water or is that also hydrated minerals? Liquid water. Liquid. Liquid water. Oceans. I think that's what you mean when you're asking about free water. It's not like a water molecule attached to a, another molecule. It's water water. So I kind of challenge you to think about what this means for your idea of what the habitable zone is, right? The sort of traditional what you've been learning in school as a kid and what you think about when you talk about exoplanets and other places in the solar system, what is the habitable zone, right? Now, traditionally, the habitable zone is defined by where do you have liquid water at the surface, stable at the surface. And in our solar system, the only place where that is is Earth, and that's how the habitable zone is defined. But when you start thinking about oceans that just happen to be in underneath an ice shell, I would argue a protective ice shell, that really changes your perspective of what this green zone should look like. I mean, if there's an ocean under the ice shell at Pluto, and there's all kinds of yummy organics at Pluto too, not a chemist, but there's good chemistry at Pluto, this green zone should, should be like another 40 AU out. And when you think about what that means for exoplanet systems, what we term as a habitable exoplanet or a potentially habitable exoplanet, they're just sticking with this could liquid water be stable at the surface definition. And I would argue that if we really care about finding life, it's not just about finding intelligent life. And rethinking what this means in the context of what we've learned about our solar system, I think is, it blows my mind when I think about it. It kind of sometimes makes me wish I was an astrobiologist, but I'm a geologist, so I'm gonna keep doing my thing. So before I slow, show you individual images of the wild places that I've told you about, I want to give you a couple of tools. 
I'm still working on this whole analogy. I think it's cool because I just want to show the picture of Batman's utility belt, but really I just want to give you a couple of guidelines to follow so that when I show you these images, you start to see the same things that I see. Craters are always going to be your best friend when somebody shows you a picture of a planetary surface. The thing to understand about a planetary surface is not just a skin that formed instantaneously around a planet. It's a geological surface that's heterogeneous. Just like on our Earth, right? A brand new surface on our planet would be like Iceland or Hawaii, right? Places where lava is literally coming out of, magma is coming out of the ground and that lava is flowing on the surface. That's creating new surface. You're resetting that clock. That's not the only way you can reset the clock. But when you look at a planet, moon, moonlit, you're just looking at that top layer and you're asking yourself, what do I know about that top layer? How old is it? Now you can't just like, I don't know, put a thermometer in the surface and say 57 years. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't even work that way on the moon. It doesn't even work that way on the earth. But the point is that you can look at this and you can say, that has a lot of craters on it. That does not. The longer a surface has been exposed to Earth, or not Earth, space, my gosh, space, the more time it's had to be hit by stuff. And the more time you've had to be hit by stuff, the older that surface is. This is a picture of, oof, I'm gonna, I, did, I picked a random one. I think this is Tethys, one of Saturn's moons. It might be Rhea. Oh, now I don't know. Um, the one over on the left, that is Miranda, that is a moon of Uranus. Um, and what's even cooler is if you actually look at that surface, you can kind of see there's two different kinds of terrains, right? You see there's, there's really stripy kind of polygonal shaped terrains, and then there's that really smooth stuff kind of down the middle. Which one's older? Just between those two surfaces, do you have a guess? The smooth stuff is older, right? There's more craters. That's your, that's your key to looking at planetary images. The next one I like to think about isn't so much about what you can see on the surface as much as what it's telling you about what's going on in the subsurface. The image on the left is an image of Io. Io's weird. It's not traditionally an ocean world. There's not a lot of water there. It's mostly volcanism and sulfur. Um, it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It's constantly being heated up by Jupiter um, through tidal forces, which means all this volcanism is just Io trying to like cool off. It's like the giant swamp cooler that Io has going on inside of it. But what's more interesting is that Io doesn't have plate tectonics or anything like we have here on Earth, and plate tectonics is the main way our Earth is cooling off. But that makes Earth unique. Nobody else has plate tectonics. A place like Io has these weird, icy, blocky, silvery mountains just kind of floating in its ice shell. And when you see a really tall thing like that, you have to think what's supporting that, right? What's keeping that from not just sort of like flowing back into the interior? And really what it comes down to is you end up with these things called roots. You get a root like that. And as this mountain gets eroded away, that's what the second panel is, as that mountain gets eroded away, that root starts to rebound. So when you see really high standing things or you see really low standing things, you have to start to ask yourself what's going on inside the crust of this planet, moon, to support that amount of topography. And that starts to help you get a sense of looking at a surface and not just looking, about, looking at the craters, but looking for places where you have maybe differences going on. And I already talked about cooling off. So this is Io again. Can you see the volcano Just spewing? Yeah, first time I saw that, it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> like, wait a minute, you mean there's real volcanoes? Um, but geologic activity of any kind is how planets cool off. Even if that planet is no longer generating its own heat or being heated up by something else, it still has heat inside that needs to get out. Um, so smaller things cool off faster. So in the case of Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, which is tiny, right, size of Washington State, has an enormous plume coming out of its south pole. And you have to ask yourself the question, how did something so tiny stay so hot, right? So it's not about necessarily using these tools to answer the question as much as it is about using these tools to figure out what the question is. And in my mind, when you see a tiny thing doing really exciting things, you have to start scratching your head and saying, what's going on? Because little things should have cooled off a long time ago. 
And that's a picture of a rat with a peanut. So the last tool that you have to use is comparative planetology. And I've alluded to this already because I've compared a lot of things to the Earth. You have to compare what you don't know to what you do know. This isn't unique to geology. It's not unique to planetary science. But in places where we live on this Earth, we're really biased to see a tectonic structure on another body and go, wait a minute, play tectonics. And then you go, wait a minute, that probably doesn't work uh, because there's no driver of that. So what are the source of that tectonic structure, right? Plate tectonics is not the only way you form a tectonic structure on another planetary body. What is the source of stress, right? What are the forces that are creating that thing? And that's taught you something not just about that tectonic structure, but it's taught you about that planetary body in general. Um, but you wouldn't have known to go there unless you knew, hey, the Earth has plate tectonics. They're characterized by having these kinds of patterns on the surface, and like we don't see that somewhere else. So complementative planetology always asks you, what do you know about something similar somewhere else that can tell you what is or is not going on here? Okay, so now we get to look at cool pictures. And I have to go through these quickly because it is 8.43. Okay, so oddities at Europa. We've already talked to, somebody mentioned Europa Clipper. There was a presentation for Clipper that was um, up on the website. Um, Europa is a place that we are li literally working on going to. Uh, there should be a launch of a spacecraft next year called Europa Clipper. Um, and I really just want to show you all these really cool pictures. Um, you can find most of these on the NASA photo journal. I don't know if you ever go there. Great place to get like the cream of the crop of images from pretty much every spacecraft ever. Um, Europa is characterized by these things called double ridges. We don't know how those form. We went to Europa in what, late 90s, early 2000s? Still don't know how those things form. We have a lot of ideas, but nobody's proved any of those ideas to be correct. Sometimes they form these long, straight double ridges, and they're double ridges, they're like this. Sometimes they form these high crust, like scalloped things with these big cusps. Sometimes they're bright orange. How do they form? I don't know. Are they volcanic? Maybe. Tectonic? Probably. That's it. That's all we know. The entire surface is covered by these things. We still don't know what they are. It's wild. It's exciting. I'm really hopeful that Europa Clipper is going to finally answer this question for us. Um, and uh, big props if you noticed this one single crater and said, where are the rest of them? And then double, double, double props if you said, are all those round things craters? The answer is none of those round things are craters. Here's a close, you can see them a little bit better here. Some of them are domes, some of them are pits. They could all be the same thing, we don't know. I love this. I love this part of the, part of the show uh, because I love talking about things that we've known about for 25 years and we have no idea what they are or how they formed. Uh, we think they're volcanic. Uh, the, the round things are called pit spots and domes. We think they're volcanic. That's the best guess we have so far. Um, but also, Europa could still be geologically active. That's a really big major question that the Europa Clipper is going to um, ask. Uh, major question Europa Clipper is going to answer. Um, there's a tentative plume observation from Hubble Space Telescope. It's a few pixels. I would argue we need more data. Um, but it's a really tantalizing thought to think that we have an active plume at a place like Europa that is constantly compared to a place like Enceladus at Saturn. And I've talked so much about Enceladus and now embarrassed that this is probably one of the few pictures I have of Enceladus in here. Um, but this is, um, this is the South Pole. So it's been put up top because that is jets of water shooting out of a tiny moon called Enceladus. So if you haven't seen this picture before, it's one of my all-time top favorites. And every time I look at it, I just don't believe it. Um, but I've been studying Enceladus for 15 years, so I kind of have to at this point. Um, these are two more pictures of Enceladus. And this is one of the things I really love about Enceladus, because the thing you'll notice about the picture on the left is that there are a lot of craters. And the picture on the right, same moon. How is that happening? I don't know. I've been working on it, though. <laughs> um, but this is one of those wild things. You have water shooting out of the South Pole. 
you have super ancient terrains and you have super young terrains that look like there's a lot of linear things on here, right? So we think that that's probably been heavily tectonized. I've been studying it a long time. I don't have a lot of answers. Um, and then you have weird stuff like this. Do you see that dark line? that's just sort of like streaked across the surface of the moon. Yeah, there's one of those on Enceladus. We don't know what that is. We see similar but different things on places like Dione and Rhea. This is something I'm actively working on. This is probably like the only data I have for you. Um, this is uh, a figure from a paper I published a couple years ago with a colleague. And we actually noticed all these green things. There are these bright streaks across the surface. Now, these ones I've officially identified as crater rays. I know, you're looking at them and you're like, obviously, they're crater rays. Um, but there's, I had to find the crater that they were coming from. And it turns out she's like nine kilometers diameter and making these huge crater rays. Um, but there's these weird streaky things that we're calling linear verge that we see on Dione and Rhea. And then there's this like one weird dark thing on Enceladus that doesn't make any sense. Um, so they just keep surprising us. Now I promised some pictures of um, the moons at Uranus. And we only have pictures of these from the Voyager 2 flybys. They're only of the Southern Hemisphere. Some of these moons like Miranda, we have like 35 pictures of. Some of the moons like Oberon, we have like seven. Um, what's really interesting about these places though is I think a lot of folks expected as Voyager 2 flew by, it's just gonna be a bunch of craters. And it turns out they all have like really wild tectonic systems on them. They're really heavily fractured um, in ways that you wouldn't expect. So you've seen this picture on the left before, that's Miranda, but this is kind of contextualizing it here on the right. And you have these like weird rectangular splotches of like heavily fractured young areas. You have this huge bite that's been taken out of the side of it. That's a giant like kilometer, multi, multi many kilometers deep, just canyon. Um, is it like just right there? Or does it go around to the other side? We don't have images of that. Right? This one kills me. I don't even know what's happening. Um, but is it the next one? It's not the next one. We're going to come back to this one. But then you have places like Ariel. If these names are starting to familiar, sound familiar, it's because they named all the moons after Shakespeare. Tempest? My eighth grade Shakespeare teacher would be upset. <laughs> but the... Um, but the moon Ariel, do you see over here? I know it's a really fuzzy image, but it's one of the better images we have. They're huge canyons. You need huge stresses to do that, or you need stresses that have been active for a really long time to make something that big. We don't know what that is. Um, and we don't have much more information. So is this a regional phenomenon or a global phenomenon? We don't have that information. Um, but what I think is really cool is you start to look at Enceladus, Miranda, and Ariel. Apparently there's Enceladus too much for that text box to handle. Um, and you actually start to see that you have places where you have heavy tectonism, orange arrows, right up against a discrete boundary that separates it from heavily cratered areas. And you have this on Enceladus at Saturn, and then you have it also on Miranda and Ariel at Uranus. And you have to start to ask yourself from a comparative planetological standpoint, while these things all look different, they all behave in really similar ways where you have heavily tectonized regions right up against heavily cratered regions. I don't have a great answer, but these are the kinds of problems me and my colleagues have a really fun time trying to figure out how we might solve it. Because these are the things that we really care about. We're not drinking through a fire hose of data, right? That's for the Mars people, but we're sitting here with 40 year old images saying, how does this work? Um, and how can we be really creative about solving these problems since we're not gonna have any more data anytime soon? Um, for the interest of time, I'm gonna skip to the cool pictures. Um, I mentioned Triton at Neptune, the one that goes backwards, um, that was captured by Neptune and probably kicked out all the other moons. Voyager captured a plume, you have to believe me, it starts off really faint, and then it gets darker, and then it gets darker. Don't look at this one. Compare these two, and you can kind of convince yourself that there's a big dark line there. And then it gets more convincing when you look at the south pole of Triton, and you see all these big 
black things that are kind of unidirectional, right? They call these fans. Um, and so these are believed to be sort of a lag deposit. This plume comes up either it's solar driven um, through the sublimation or the warming of some kind of, <clears throat> this is where I'm not a chemist, um, like a cloth rate or something that takes just a small temperature change for it to just go whoosh, and you have a, this lag deposit. We don't know if these are solar driven or if they're volcanically driven, but Triton wasn't supposed to be that interesting, right? And you have a surface that, what do you not see on this picture? Craters. Craters. But we have evidence of active, you know, plume deposition um, or deposition from some kind of active plume mechanism. Nobody thought that should happen at Neptune. And then also at Triton, you get weird things like cantaloupe terrain. Looks like the skin of a cantaloupe now that you think about it, right? Um, and then you have these things that look an awful lot like a caldera. Is it actually volcanism? Maybe. That's the best theory we have. But how do you get something that probably got captured by Neptune a long time ago? Have a surface that young and that active. Um, we don't have good answers to that, but it's really exciting to think about all the different possibilities. And then, of course, Pluto. Um, again, Pluto being a place that nobody thought was going to be interesting, but we have water ice glaciers floating in blowing nitrogen ice. I mean, and maybe right Mons might be a volcano, that thing that looks like a belly button, kind of on the side. Such cool stuff. Um, and then at Sharon, they think this might be Kubrick Mons. None of these things are official names yet, which is really disappointing. Um, but Kubrick Mons is this kind of high standing thing here. And that's when your brain goes, okay, you've got a high standing thing there and you've got a bunch of craters. What's underneath there supporting that? So we're nearing the end here, and I want to talk a little bit about where we are in the solar system, specifically the outer solar system and where we're headed. Um, somebody mentioned Juno tonight. Juno is still active at Jupiter. Um, if you don't know the story of Juno Cam, please go look it up. It's really exciting. If you don't know, the sort of short version is that the camera Juno was proposed and selected as a mission to go to Jupiter without a camera because it wasn't a mission that was supposed to take pictures, it was supposed to study the atmosphere and the magnetosphere and all of the other spheres. Um, and JunoCam was an idea that, um, I don't know if it was Scott Bolton, the PI, but somebody was like, no, no, you gotta bring a camera. For education and public outreach, at a minimum, you need a camera. So they tacked on this camera. Well, the camera was so successful, the scientists were like, yeah, we're gonna need that. Um, so now it's essentially an uncalibrated camera that they're using as a science instrument. And they're doing these flybys now that we're in extended mission of places like Ganymede and Europa. And we're getting to see places that we never got to see with Galileo at better resolution, right? I mean, so this is just totally um, brand new data that we haven't had in 20 years. And it's really, really exciting stuff. Um, and Juno has been an enormous success. New Horizons is still on the fast track out of here. Um, it doesn't currently, as far as I know, have any targets, but the Small Bodies Assessment Group is meeting in DC this week. Um, and while I'm not going, I'm having dinner with somebody that's going. So I'm hoping I get to hear some cool stuff about what's going on with New Horizons. But the latest on New Horizons is that NASA wants to move it out of the Planetary Science Division and into astrophysics. Anybody know? They're trying to move it out from underneath planetary science and move it into a separate division because their argument is that it's no longer doing planetary science. We will see how that plays out. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's going to, he I don't know if it's going to, but if it was, it would be going to heliophysics. And I think it's supposed to go to astronomy and astrophysics. The point being that it's still a highly functional spacecraft. And when they were designing the spacecraft, they essentially designed these cameras to practically be telescopes because they knew once it passed Pluto, it was going to need to do something. So you, you don't want to just shut off a $2 billion spacecraft. Eh, $1 billion. Right? If it's still fully functional and it can give you some cool science about places in the solar system we haven't been before, you want to keep it going. But that's all we have in the outer solar system right now. Um, we have juice on the way. Europa Clipper, I think is my next slide. Nope, it's Dragonfly. Here, we'll skip ahead. Europa Clipper is launching next October. Um, it should arrive in 2030. For those of you keeping score at home, it's launching after juice and getting there first. Um, and this is no longer their logo. But it's going to go to Europa, the moon I showed you with all the weird double ridges that nobody knows what those are. Um, and we think that 
you know, we've got this liquid water ocean. And so what they're really hoping to do is use, they've got a radar sounder so they can kind of penetrate into the ice. And they want to try and find places where either the ice shell is really thin, so places where the Europa lander may be able to go back and actually successfully drill, or places where you have pockets of warmer ice really close to the surface that also might be really good for drilling. Because right now there are folks working on very cool robots that are supposed to melt through the ice and get into that ocean and really try and see what's, on, what's going on down there. Um, but to go back to Dragonfly, Dragonfly's had a couple of delays through no fault of Dragonfly team. They have been working super hard with all of the delays in supply chain issues and pandemic times. Um, they're set to launch in 2027. If you've never heard of this mission, I would go to the website and check it out. It's a octocopper, no. It's a rotorcraft. It has eight rotors, two stacked on top of each other. I'm sure there's somebody who understands this physics better than I do, but there's essentially four um, sets of propellers. But because, pardon? Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. The atmosphere is so thick that you can fly these huge golf cart sized roto rotocraft there. And so it's going to essentially, like a dragonfly, land, do a lot of geochemistry, astrobiology, and sort of hop its way across the surface um, and do some really, really exciting chemistry. And us geologists are like really excited about getting outcrop scale images. Um, so with that, I'm trying to make sure we have time for questions. Um, I hope I really convinced you how awesome and weird our actual solar system is, um, because I think the weirdness in our solar system is one of the best things about it, um, but it's also one of the tools, best tools we have to get up close and personal with the rest of the weirdness in our universe. Um, so I hope I've convinced you to just go stare at cool pictures um, and get excited about these um, missions that are coming up, and I hope you guys have some questions. I know it's past nine, but I think there's some time. I hope it's okay. Okay, questions here first, and maybe repeat them. So. Yeah, um, I'll try and repeat the questions for folks online, and if folks have questions online, you can type them into the chat. So the question was, how confident are we that we have subterranean oceans other than Europa? So the ocean under Europa was confirmed um, through magnetic experiments by the, um, uh, I was going to say Europa Clipper mission, by the Galileo spacecraft. You can't do those same kinds of measurements at Saturn because you don't have the same funny blips, they're not blips, but you don't have the same phenomenon in the magnetic field at Saturn that you do at Jupiter that allows you to make these kinds of detections. So things like at Enceladus, we have a series of pieces of data that come together um, that tell us that there's a global liquid water ocean there other than, or in lieu of that single detection, or that detection that we have at Jupiter. So first we have an enormous amount of water shooting out of the South Pole. It is water. There's a little bit of other things in there that tell us that it's a salty, probably bubbly ocean. Um, and then we have that in conjunction with gravity measurements from the multiple flybys that the Cassini mission made of Enceladus that tells us that that gravity information is consistent with having a liquid layer in the subsurface. And I'm not a gravity person, so I can't give you more details than that. We have multiple sources of evidence that come together that are consistent with that story. And when you add that up with the other kinds of data that you would expect to find at some of these other places where we can't detect an ocean, you look at the surface geology and say, how would you have formed this if you don't have a liquid water ocean in the subsurface? And generally, the answer is, if you have a liquid layer, some of these landforms are a lot easier to make. Yes. So I'm with you now. I think the Hubble is on definition. Uh, <laughs> so, but I'm also thinking that uh, I may have, my introductory astronomy classes, what I tell the Kelvin is that the energy that we are getting to have with the water is tidal. I'm starting to think that that's an oversimplification, but. Um, I'm wondering, if, could there, could we, instead of having a solar system planetary forever, 
Habilulu zone. Have individual Habilulu zones around the world. You know, Jupiter has a certain mass. It's going to be throwing its weight around. Literally, it's going to cause tidal heating. Right. So I don't know from a from a geologist's point of view, is there some way to actually think of a habitable zone around? That's a really good question. So the question, I'm going to shorten it and hopefully I get it right. So the question is, rather than thinking about a habitable zone around a star, could we start thinking about what habitable zones might look like around individual planets since we're thinking about planetary systems as their own mini quasi solar systems in a way? And um, the answer is, yeah, maybe. And so I, I think this is a really interesting question because, like I said before, our sort of traditional habitable zone is really defined by places where we can have liquid water stable at the surface, which has an awful lot to do with your distance from your star, and also hopefully that your star won't fry you. Um, so you have to be at that, that sweet spot. When it comes to heating a moon around a giant planet, you're right, tidal heating is an enormous part of that. For places like Europa, you also have resonances in the orbits with like things like Ganymede. Um, so it's not just about Europa's tugging um, on, uh, again, Jupiter's tugging on Europa. You also have to, for that to be important, you need to have an eccentric orbit so that that tugging changes magnitude with time. And then you have the resonances with the other moons. So in the case of Europa and Ganymede, it's like Europa goes around twice for every one of Ganymede, something like that. Look, at that's not right, but it's something like that. So to define those things in space and time to define that zone would be complicated, but I think it could be really cool. I think it would be complicated for an exoplanet system because so far we know about the planets, but I don't think we know about whether or not any of those planets have moons. There's so many variables. There's so many variables. Like, you could have a binary star. Okay, that just messes yeah, everything up. Yeah, totally messed it up. Atmospheres on these worlds, that messes things totally. up. Totally. The type of atmosphere, that's going to change it too. I know, but it's really fun to think about how it's complicated really it would be. Totally and it's like, is that a habitable zone or is that an ocean world zone? I didn't say the word ocean world very often, but all of these places that we talked about tonight I are considered ocean worlds, whether they're current ocean worlds or past ocean worlds. They're all ocean worlds. So is it an ocean world zone, the zone in which you would get a subsurface ocean, so that it's more of a geothermal zone? I don't know. I like this idea, but it's really complicated because you're right. There's a ton of variables, yeah, right? How, what's, what was your original? How much rock did you initially have, right? Because that tells you how many you know, how much heating you would have just from the radioisotopes that you had in the initial dose of rock that you got, right? I mean, that's also really important too. That's a, big, that's a big part of where our Earth's heat, you know, what was your formation process? How much accretionary heat did you have from when you kind of glommed together into a giant ball? Like, I think it's a cool idea. I have a question on Mark. Yes. So uh, Janet asks, since the JWST has shown us such wonderful pictures of the outer planets, could it be used in some way for finding out more about the moons? Yeah, Janet, that's a really great question. And I really, really wish I had added in the JWST pictures of Enceladus. Now, here's the good news and the bad news. From a geologist standpoint, the bad news is JWST is not showing us photos of the surface of Enceladus that are good enough to do what I would call photogeology, which I feel like is kind of an old fashioned term, but it does a really good job describing the kind of image I'm looking for. Um, but what JWST is doing for us at Enceladus is it's actually looked at Enceladus and it's looking at the plume that's coming out of Enceladus. And so it shows this image where Enceladus is like a pixel and the plume is like 200 pixels. <laughs> it's just huge. Um, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, and I don't think anybody thought that the plume was going to be that big. And so I think there's really good questions here to be asked about whether or not JWST can get time to look for Europa's plume, because I think there's a lot of us who were like, cool, but I need more evidence. And I think places like Enceladus, you know, if we can see how big that plume is, can we start doing studies to see how much more 
variability there is. We know that Enceladus's plume varies on diurnal time scales and on decadal time scales in terms of brightness variability, which means the volume of stuff coming out is, you know, it's dimming and brightening with time, which means there's more and less stuff coming out. Can we now use JWST to start looking for plumes at these moons? So with a geological standpoint, I don't think JWST is going to help us. But in terms of detecting geologic activity like plume activity, I think JWST is going to be huge. You're welcome. That's it. Okay. Yep. Do you want to ask another question? Any other question? <laughs> <laughs> so with, with Europa and Enceladus, it seems to me as if you know, they're obviously like Io, which is erupting every day. Sure. It does seem like Europa and Enceladus are very fertile volcanism. Cryovolcanism? Cryovolcanism. Act. Sure. So how would uh, one my question is is how long is that going on? Mm -hmm. Um how much of that water is like, as a fraction of the amount of water it has? Mm -hmm. Essentially, when is it gonna empty itself out? Sure. So the question um specifically Europa and at what point are these just gonna cry volcanically themselves out? Um so in the case of Europa, I would say that because the plume detections have been so tenuous, I would argue that like nobody's worried about them just volcanic, you know, volcanically extinguishing themselves. Um, I think if you look, see, I'm going to use this comparative planetology. I think if you look at a place like Io that's so volcanically active that it's the most active one in the solar system, and it hasn't gone anywhere because most of that material is coming back down to its surface. And so what they think is you pile enough stuff up onto the surface, the stuff at the bottom starts getting shoved down into the center of the planet, moon, um, where it gets remelted and gets recycled all over again. And I think a lot of that same kind of thing is probably happening at Enceladus because the fraction of material escaping into the E-ring and never coming back to Enceladus is like less than 10%. And some of that material will come from the E-ring will come back, but like 90 plus percent of the material coming out of the plume falls back down onto the surface of Enceladus. Um, do we have evidence that there's some kind of vertical recycling system on Enceladus? We do not have that evidence. Um, if all of the material that left Enceladus, the South Pole, left the Enceladus system, I don't think we would have an Enceladus anymore. Um, I just published a paper at the beginning of this year that was trying to figure out how much of that plume fallback, essentially how much of that snow that's coming out of the plume on Enceladus is landing back onto the surface. And can we measure how much there is and back out how long the plume has been going? And I came up with like 10 billion years, <laughs> which I'm not about to pitch to you that the solar system's twice as old as we think it is. Um, so I don't want to say we've gone back to the drawing board, but what our conclusion is, is that the rate in which the plume is ejecting material out of the tiger stripe, we didn't talk about these, but essentially the rate at which that plume is erupting is just not high enough. And what does that mean? It means planets change over four and a half billion years. And so do rates of volcanism. And so the argument we made in the paper is that there's really good evidence in the amount of material we found on the surface for that plume to have been significantly more active in the past. And all we've based our understanding of the plume on is a 13 year window at which Cassini was there and a couple of pieces of data we have from Voyager. And we've said, that's it, we know it, it's been constant for four and a half billion years. I would, I would call you out on that mm -hmm. and say 40 years of data isn't enough to know what happened four billion years ago. So I think there's a lot of really good questions there and I don't have the answer, but I think um, this is the thing that I'm actively working on um, to try and see if we can use geological evidence to match up with the models that folks are doing of the plumes right now, because I'm not a model person, I'm an observational person, but you need to have that to kind of match up with the models, right? And so going back to the modelers and saying, okay, so what if it hasn't been constant for four and a half billion years? Because nobody thinks that's right. And does that mean that what we're seeing at Europa is just a slump? And that at some point Europa was much more active, had many more vent sources. I think that's a really cool comparison. Oh, just a really quick follow-up. Um, how excited are you that phosphorus is flying? 
Oh my gosh. So the question was, how excited was I about phosphorus? So if you don't know about this detection, they found phosphorus in the plume at Enceladus. And this wasn't a new detection necessarily in that it wasn't new data from some new spacecraft. This was folks going back to the Cassini data archive and going back through it. This is what we do in the outer solar system. We don't have a fire hose to drink through. <laughs> so we go back to the archives and we just keep digging. When we talk about liquid water as being really important for astrobiology, it's just one of the ingredients, right? You also need en energy, you also need chemistry. And the fourth one that nobody really talks about is you need enough time for life to form. Um, but that chemistry is really, really important. And the chemicals that we really care about, um, you use the acronym SCHNAPS or CHNAPS, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And up until this point, we've had everything but the P. And now we have the P, which means we now have all the things we think we actually need. And what's really exciting about this phosphorus detection, it's not just like, we think we found it. It's like, oh no, we found it, it's a strong signal. So it's not just a, you know, it's not just a tentative detection, it's a really, really solid detection. And we have the solid detections of all the other things too, which means we now essentially have all of the ingredients in a way that we don't have for any other place in the solar system. So if you're gonna use these things as a way to define what's the best habitable environment to go to, to do a search for life, you now kind of start to understand why the decadal survey came out and said, we wanna to go to Uranus first and foremost. But NASA, if you're gonna give us an extra 4 billion, we really wanna to go to Enceladus with the Enceladus Orbilander, which is another mission study that was done out of um, Johns Hopkins University, the Applied Physics Lab. And you can go find, go Google Orbilander, you'll find it. So if you're gonna pick a habitable environment, you want one that has all the chemistry, all the water, all the energy. And I think some might argue you don't have all those things at Europa. Mm 